Greetings, and welcome back to another episode of The Greatest Show in the Galaxy, the show where I, the curator, discuss my personal favorite show of all time, personal favorite franchise of all time, Doctor Who. And today we are continuing our roundup of companion departures in honor of our good, uh, duly departed friend, Ben Rayner. And uh, this time is a little bit different because we're not talking about any of the television companions. We are talking about companions from other media, mainly Big Finish, but a couple of comic book ones as well. And uh, now we have someone who actually requested to be here uh, on uh, this episode. It's not going to be Ryan again. As much as I love having Ryan on and it was his idea in the first place, this guy actually, when he heard that I'm doing this topic... He specifically requested to be on this episode in particular. Say hello to my new favorite Utermazin, Snark. Oh, uh, yes. I'm also a mass murderer as well. And that's the show, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, 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 what? How dare you, sir? How dare you? How I was going to say, you, you, you are my... I was going to say that you are my favorite Doctor Who related host that I've ever had uh, been on a show with. And then you go and do something like that. Unbelievable. You Give don't somebody. have the authority. I don't need authority. I have a screwdriver. Ooh. How dare you? How dare you, sir? That sounds familiar. Yeah. One of these days I'm going to cut the majority of the, of this thing out and just keep that. <laughs> you, sir. Oh. Yeah, I, right. I just love John Hurd going, how dare you, sir? <laughs> now, uh, as per usual, we start off each episode of uh, this show with the birthday section. Now, unfortunately, we're still not 100% caught up to when this episode will actually air or is even being recorded. But I am determined to continue covering each and every week until we finally ca get caught up to wh where we actually are in the proper timeline. So today we're counting down from the 10th of January all the way up to the 16th. And on the 11th, we have Mr. David Hodgson. Now, speaking of Big hmm. Finish, he does do a lot of uh, um, Big Finish stuff. Like He did, he did some stuff for a... Uh, uh, new front for uh, big finish new frontiers invaders from mars a eight doctor and, and charlie uh paul art story he was in robots of sherwood on the television show but mm -hmm. for the most part he's mostly known for playing the character panda on big finish it is a companion just not necessarily the one you're thinking of it is a companion of iris wild time a sort of supplementary character a within the realm of Doctor Who Big Finish, played by Katie Manning, who also played Joe Grant on the television show. But yeah, Panda is pretty much what it what it says. It's like a little sentient panda plush doll. Just you know, don't mention that in front of him. But yeah, it's a really, really funny character. Oh, and uh, always a pleasure to hear. Now on the 12th, we have I apologize if I'm uh, mispronouncing the name. Gethin Jones. Gethin Jones. Well, he's a he's a TV presenter who actually played himself on uh, the premiere episode of the Sarah Jane Adventures Invasion of the Bane. Uh, he's, he also presented a... Uh, uh, he was also uncredited as a, as a premiere presenter on one of the Doctor Who uh, Be uh, Blue Peter stuff. And he also played a Cyberman and a Dalek. In both Rise of the Cybermen and the Age of Steel, as well as the Stolen Earth and Journey's End. I knew I recognized him from somewhere. Yeah, of course. It's, it's got to be the voice, right? It's got to be mm -hmm. the voice. That's right. Yeah. On the 13th, we have Mr. Jack Watling. Now, now Jack Watling, as seen in this picture right here, played the character of Edward Travers in the second Doctor stories, The Abominable Snowman Ooh. and... Uh, the Web of Fear. Now, what is special about his character in particular is that he's actually one of the very few Doctor Who characters, especially in the classic series, that actually came back in, in, several serials later. And the the 
the really special part about it is he played this character and then he played the same character just 40 years older because there's like a the 40 year time gap between one episode and the other one and he like he's still the same actor but you could you would be uh forgiven if you thought that it would, they were played by different actors because of all the prosthetics and how he changes up his performance in between those two uh, uh appearances and if that wasn't enough for you he's also the father of Deborah Watling who played the character the second doctor companion at the time Victoria Waterfield so he oh. actually got to play this character alongside his daughter and uh, there's, a, there's I rewatched both of these episodes fairly recently. There's a moment there where where he's where he finally realizes that uh, the doctor's been telling the truth the whole time, and that they actually were time travelers the whole time. And he's and he's pointing at Victoria, played by his daughter, and he's like, "She was born before I while before I was born." <laughs> so yeah, really, really funny moment there. And on the fourteenth, speaking of. Famil- companions with familial connections and uh, fa- fathers and daughters. There seems to be a theme today here because we have Miss Shema Red, uh. who of course played Kate Stewart in the revived series, and she's actually appeared in alongside every modern doctor except for Eccleston. Obviously, she played. She was. Yeah. Along- she acted alongside both. Uh, David Tennant, Matt Smith, and John Hurt in the 50th. She later moved on to Capaldi as well as Whitaker. And she's already, uh, right now, as we speak, filming scenes with Shuri Gatwa, the 15th stock. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Yeah, spoiler alert for something that's already in the news right now. Also on the 14th, I did say that this is kind of a theme today. We have Miss, and again, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing the name. I am terrible with names let me try this a joa ando yeah she she first appeared in new earth my first ever story uh, doctor who story that i ever watched as oh. sister jet and she has uh, appeared alongside uh, she has made continuous appearances as various different characters on, on big finish as well but she's mostly recognized as martha jones's mother the mother of freeman adjuman's character the uh, companion of the of the 10th doctor and uh continuing the tradition of of a doctor who mothers who slapped the doctor and on <laughs> the, on the 15th of january we have the man himself mr jeffrey beavers the master obviously he played the master in uh the keeper of kraken that was one appearance there but obviously he then returned Multiple, 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 multiple times on Big Finish. He's one of the most prominent uh, b- uh, Big Finish char- characters. The only one of the classic masters still alive. So that's why he keeps popping up again and again. He keeps uh, playing the master over and over again. And uh, just for you, just because I, I knew you would like this. A new day. I, I love it. <laughs> yeah, he can hardly be recognized uh, without his evil goatee. I, I... Yeah, and finally, on the 15th, Mr. Richard Franklin, who played the character Captain Mike Yates, alongside the, the uh, third Doctor and the, the fourth Doctor. He played the character uh, during the, uh, the majority of John Purpose's run as the doctor in unit obviously he has a bit of a heel turn towards the end there has a redemption arc and then he shows back up again in the nest cottage chronicles alongside tom baker as the fourth doctor as an older man and he keeps popping up again on and off again on again off again all over big finish so the lovely list of people we had today thank you all we quite literally could not do this without you Hmm. speaking of people with people that we couldn't possibly do this show without them i think it's time we just jump right into the deep waters and go ahead and talk about the woman of the hour Mm. literally and figuratively miss charlie pollard charlotte Charlotte pollard pollard Pollard. charlotte pollard edwardian adventurous charlie to her friends charlie to her friends the signature 
big finish companion of the eighth doctor. Now, Mr. Snark, yeah. you're only aware of this character because I strong armed you, forced you by, by yes. the throat. You are a monster. Okay, I'd like to say first off, before you go any further, you are a monster, sir. Okay, please continue. Yeah, forced you by the throat to go and listen to the Eighth Doctor um, adventure Neverland as mm -hmm. a bit of a follow up, sorry, as a precursor to Zagreus. Right. We talked about last year and. Uh, Inadvertently so, you kind of fell in love with the character of Charlie Pollard, and uh, you actually went ahead and uh, listened to all of her adventures with the Eighth Doctor and beyond. So, mm -hmm. what did you think about yeah. this character? For, uh, let's start with that. Okay, of course, uh, Charlie. I will say is now the companion. I feel. Uh, the closest to, and there's been all kinds of fantastic companions. I have some, wait, over here, I have some companions just hanging around. Uh, but Charlie, I think it's because um, it's an audio adventure that you have to depend so much on India Fisher's voice and the way uh, they have to describe everything that's happening. It draws you into the character more. Um, and also, I have no point of reference. I still have never seen the Eighth Doctor's uh, TV movie. I've never seen it. So it's not only is that Charlie is uh, uh, my point of reference to the Eighth Doctor, like Big Finish is my point of reference to the Eighth Doctor, not only and then to Charlie and then her further adventures, which I know some of. And then I found out I may not know all of, which is fun. But uh, yes. Uh, the Charlie Pollard Edwardian Adventurous uh, episodes of Big Finish were huge. I love them. I love them. It, it's made me realize that, or come to come to grips with, I would love to, and I can't wait to, dive more into the audio adventures of Doctor Who. I think they're so fun. Me too. It's a, it's a great medium for Doctor Who. You, you normally associate Doctor Who with these iconic, striking visuals, but when you really stop and think about it, so much of, like, deep Doctor Who lore is on audio. Not just with Big Finish, but also with the missing episodes. Like, the only reason we can still have some of them today is because the audio for those episodes survived. So, right. a lot of Doctor Who is, you know, just very... Um, audio based and uh we we think uh the lords of the doctor who can and wow. uh, to maintain uh all of that for us now obviously she started off as being the, the doctor's companion in uh storm warning which was the debut episode of uh, paul mccann on yeah. uh, have you listened to that by the way i never yep, asked i have i listened to that the next one the uh, sword of orion um i uh, now those, that first episode, okay, Storm Warning is a great Doctor. It's just like you can hold up Storm Warning to any Doctor Who episode. It's fantastic. Yes. Sort of Orion uh, with Charlie. Charlie is just more there for exposition. She's really just kind of a, just making color towards everything. I wasn't a huge fan of Sort of Orion, at least not Charlie in it. Um, but that first episode, uh, Storm Warning, like when they're aboard the, oh, I can't ever remember what it's called, the A-130 or whatever, that, uh, the blimp that goes. Uh, the A-101. The A-101, uh, A1, yeah. R-101, I think. Yeah. Fantastic. It's a, like, it's an episode of Doctor Who. Forget it if the, that it's an audio episode. It stands up there with any Doctor Who episode I think I've ever watched. I loved it. I, I, and so it automatically draws you into this character. I thought it was weird that she called herself an Edwardian adventuress right off the bat uh, with no point of reference and stuff like that. I don't know if she just thought that the Edwardian age was going to last for years and years like his, like her, like Ed, Edward's father or Edward's mother, I should say. But uh, yeah, uh, it's a terrific episode. Um, just sort of Ryan really wasn't but it gets so much better it gets so much better as soon as you get to to neverland fantastic zagreus fantastic and then yeah but we'll i'll let you go on 
Well, to be fair to her, though, no one really knows how long a certain age is going to go. I mean, yeah. I'm that's, what, I'm that's why I thought it was funny, though, 50. No one knows. Like, like no one ever, like, called themselves a Victorian or whatever. It, like, pe that's for people. That's for people in the future to say. I don't think it's for people in the in the moment to say. Now, I'm, I'm trying to think of a good example, but unfortunately, oh, I don't have a. I don't have a good one, so I'm just going to go ahead and say that the Third Reich was supposed to go on for a thousand years. <sighs> Look how long that lasts. I did. I did. I did warn you. No good example there. But the Third Reich was intended nope. to go on for a thousand years. Yeah. And look how long that lasted. So, you know. But any, but anyways, uh, she she meets the doctor uh, sort of by accident, uh, and it's sort of a she's sort of a time space anomaly. She was supposed to die. She was born on the day the Titanic sank, and was yep. supposed to die on the day the R one hundred one crashed. Sort of like. Her life was uh, surrounding, surrounded by uh, these. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, milestone, milestone events. Not, like, not, like milestone, not milestone events. Just you know, just uh, vehicle related, transport related oh, disaster. Okay. All right. Yeah, along, along the way, she got to she uh, got to be a, a big part of the doctor's life. She even met the brigadier at one point. Did you actually mm -hmm. have something minuet in hell? I haven't heard that, but I know uh, about her knowing the uh, brigadier at least uh, as the TARDIS. The TARDIS being oh. the brigadier, but we can talk about them a bit. Yeah, she she went on as we mentioned earlier with Neverland, and then late, uh, later Zagreus. She went with the Doctor to the Divergent Universe. They spent a lot of time traveling alongside uh, fellow companion Keras, the Termazin. Then they came back to the main universe, and then a couple of episodes later, unfortunately, Keras uh, had to sacrifice himself uh, to to save the Doctor and uh, Charlie, which really threw a wedge between those two characters. Yeah, right up, right up until her sort of. Final adventure with the Eighth Doctor in the Girl Who Never Was, where surprise, surprise, she finds herself on another potential shipwreck. I did say that these things seem to follow her like uh, flies. Yeah, you're right. Fl flies on a big, a big Ooh, chocolate boy. cake. Now, obviously, what? At the, obviously, at the, at the very tail end of uh, the uh, uh, the Girl Who Never Was. She ends up being stranded in, in the far, far future. The, the doctor believes she was dead, but then the episode ends with a, a TARDIS landing. We hear the familiar sound effect, and we clearly know that it's the doctor's TARDIS because she recognizes it. Again, it's audio, so you can't see it, but she recognizes it as the doctor's TARDIS because it's shaped like a police box. She walks inside, and then her, the final, word, yeah, her final words were... Oh, I'm sorry. I was expecting someone else. Now, clearly, this seemed to suggest that it's not her doctor, that it's a different doctor. But because she is because of the specific phrase that she used, which also just happens to be the first line uttered by the sixth doctor, it's pretty easy to to uh, to figure out. Which doctor was that uh, landed and responded to her uh, distress call? So then she starts traveling with the sixth doctor for a little bit. I was gonna say also, as they also break into the sixth doctor's theme as soon as she says it too. So it's like, oh yeah, I get it now. I was very excited when uh, I heard that, uh, and also this is notwithstanding that when we were doing the uh, the Doctor Who uh, theme song uh, ranking list. I don't think we had the Sixth Doctor's uh, theme very high. Memory, memory says or whatever. Yeah, I, but uh, I was really excited as soon as I heard that or whatever. And then that dum 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 dum. It was like yes, I was very excited to hear that. I was also excited that I continued to listen past the end of the episode and that I caught that tag. Because <laughs> sometimes I'll just go, okay, I have to go on to the next. But I did stick around to the end of that episode. So, yes, very excited. Yeah, I, I think I, I mentioned this to you uh, off 
uh, camera. The oh. Sixth Doctor is absolutely, without a doubt, my favorite Doctor on Big. He always gets the best scripts, the best storylines, best supporting characters, best companions. He's great. I love him. Yeah, He's, yeah I, I really story, enjoyed these Charlie episodes. I really did. Yeah, and and if it wasn't for the for all the bad episodes he had on the TV show, and again, not Colin Baker's fault, he would have been much much high up on my list as one of my as one of my, my he might have been one of my top five favorite doctors. But mm -hmm. uh, to reference what you were saying earlier, uh, this is the uh, tier rankings we had for uh, the intros, and uh, I think yeah, there we go. This is the sixth Doctor one. I, I yeah. I'm still I'm still a little bit upset that it's not higher up on the list, but you know what? Water under the bridge at this point. Anyways, so uh, the other ones are pretty good. They're pretty good. Yeah, and you know what? Because of his because his stories are so good on Big Finish, and they're always also associated with that that theme song. You sort of start to um, um, like the theme a little bit more. 100%. I I was looking forward to it. Uh, as soon as I heard the, uh, like, at the end of um, The Girl Who Never Was, as soon as I heard that theme or whatever, I was, like, looking for it. It was like, I'm going to be uh, listening to some Six Doctor adventures on audio, like, that I've never heard of before. So I got very excited. And, like, and, but the anchor for that for me is Charlie. Charlie is the anchor for me for uh, a doctor that I'd never seen before in eighth and a doctor that I never gave, you know, I like, I never cared about too much there in the sixth, but I've really enjoyed the episodes that I listened to with Charlie and the sixth doctor. I really did. Uh, even though it sounds like uh, uh, Colin Baker's voice is a little tired and stuff like that, but you can still tell, you know, that's the doctor. Like when he, when he speaks, that's the doctor. So you just get it. Uh, yeah, I was very, I was, I was very happy with the Charlie episodes with the Sixth Doctor, but I loved the Eighth Doctor with Charlie. Loved yeah, it. It's unfortunate that at a certain point on Big Finish, you really, really start to notice Colin Baker's voice just starting to go, and it only gets worse and worse with with the years. He keeps, he keeps doing that. I think it's a problem that both he and Peter Davidson suffer from on Big Finish, but you're right. Acting-wise and dialogue-wise, they're still the Doctor. There's no mistaking that. Uh -huh. So the voice thing, it just comes up comes up as an afterthought. Yep. If we, if we were watching, if this was a televised show or whatever, not just audio, you wouldn't even think twice about it. Like, that's the doctor. That's Charlie. You get it. It's just that you just hear it or whatever. So it, 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 the voice just seems a little strained, a little tired. Uh, because, and also, it was 15, 20 years, 25 years since his last episode by the time I heard. Yeah, by the time I heard the Sixth Doctor and Charlie. So it was yeah, a long so, time. And, and also, both Peter Davison and Colin Baker recently came back to the show on television in The Power of the Doctor. And I think that the reason why they had such a great transition back into the modern uh, series uh, without losing a step is because they've been playing these characters for the better part of 25 years, five years already yeah. on, on audio. So, And I feel good, like I feel good for, for Colin Baker. Like, uh, to lose his job while being the doctor, like to have it taken especially, from him. Especially the way that, they, that it happened. Yeah. Like, through a phone call before the his final season even went to air, and he had to go do prom promotion uh, stuff and promotion tours and like interviews as the doctor, lying to people that he's still going to be going to play the part for, for many more years. It's just heartbreaking. What, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, it, so it's, it's good. It's good that he had this chance to do more. And by more, there's a lot of Six Doctor adventures on Big Finish. Big Finish is a wonderful thing. Like if if no one's like I like me, I had never listened to Big Finish before 
50 got me to listen to, uh, he wanted to do the uh, um, anniversary episode. So we listened to Zagreus, but he had me listen to Neverland before that. So I had an idea. And I don't know if it's, it's probably, it might probably be because it's my first uh, Big Finish episode. But I love Neverland. Neverland is probably my favorite uh, Big Finish episode uh, still. And there's just, like, there's so much there's, uh, like, I remember talking to you, 50, after listening to it and just, like, saying, like, uh, on this is what happens uh, with Gallifrey and stuff like that. Like, I want to listen to all the Gallifrey stuff, but I was like, but I got to listen to all the Charlie Eighth Doctor things. And then you're like, well, Charlie may not be finished after the Eighth Doctor, so I have to get through the Eighth Doctors, and well, here you are with the Sixth Doctor. Listen to these ones and stuff like that. So I listen to those ones, and now I'm I'm thinking, I think that's done. But I can go online, and now I'm noticing that there's more Charlie Adventures. It's not just it's not just the Eighth and the Sixth Doctor. There's other things like Companion Adventures and stuff. There's a lot. There's a lot to listen to. That's why that's why I was so hesitant to get you hooked on the big finish train because once you get on it, you just a you don't want to get off, but also there's like you have no idea the directions it could go. Like it's mm-hmm. it's a massive, massive thing. I'm unfortunately I'm in the unfortunate position where I actually started with Gallifrey before I listened to any of uh, the uh, Eighth Doctor Adventures. Now I'm not complaining because Gallifrey is easily I think my favorite spin-off, out of, mm-hmm. spin-off of, out of all the Doctor Who ones on Big Finish. However, yeah, that's right, the Romanas. But unfortunately, though, India Fisher's there playing Charlie's sister. And she's a horrible person. So that was my first introduction to India Fisher's character. And yeah, that, 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 that's... As much as I love Charlie as a character, that first introduction to her playing a sort of Charlie Pollard-esque character, it still sticks out like a th- sore thumb. Whenever so I not even it. not even like a Mira, a not a Mira Charlie. Like not uh, the Mira, the one that uh, kind of takes over her her body and Mila. stuff like that. Yeah, sorry, Mila. Mila. Yeah, that no, takes no, she's, up. She's yeah. horrible. Again, it's the same time period. And considering what happens during that time period, basically she's a Nazi supporter. Her sister. What? Yes. She, like she actually legit. She's in love with the Fuhrer. In that. What? Time. Yeah. Oh my god! Imagine, imagine going from this to Charlie. Going from this to Charlie? No thanks. Yeah, it's like now, oh, gross. I was like, I was so looking forward to Gallifrey. Now, do I even want to listen to it? Great, it's great. And she's only in the one episode, so you don't have to worry. Gallifrey is amazing, but as soon as you hear India Fisher's voice, it's like, oh, how how has the the apple fallen so far from the tree with these two sisters? One's an Edwardian adventurous, and one's just a fucking jerk. Yeah. And she really, she really commits to that uh, part of the, uh, the character. But, but anyways, back to Charlie. Back to not a cool. Better. It's not cool. Now back to a much better character. I think the reason, the, the thing that makes Charlie such a great character and such a great companion is that she really is just as she was for you, a entry point for both the Eighth Doctor as well as the Sixth Doctor. She works perfectly well with both of these two doctors. Right. She's a great character. And unfortunately her time was eventually with both of these two doctors, you know that eventually her time with them is going to come short because uh, of how she was saved from the R101 with the eighth doctor. And because she met the sixth doctor before she met her proper real doctor, you know, you know that there's not going to be a happy ending there somehow. And of course it ends with the Viren storyline. Yes. So we talked we talked about the Virens in the um uh alien creatures uh tier ranking list that we did last year. Now I get it. Yeah. 
these guys are pretty menacing. Like, but but are they horrible? Are they horrible? They're, they're, no, they're, not, they're not horrible. They're, they're just yeah. very single minded, very yes. committed to, the, to. They have a, a goal. Mm. We're not privy to what that goal is, but they're very committed to it. And God help yeah. those who get in their way. Like, even in the episode Patient Zero, as yeah. we see, they go up against the Daleks and yeah. they're completely unfazed by them. There's, there's that cool moment where. One of the Daleks shoots one of the Virons. The Viron just explodes and then just reverses time and reassembles itself. Yeah. The Daleks, the Daleks shoot shoot him again, blows up again, then reassembles again. So these guys are basically indestructible. They are unkillable. And some would even argue they are even more powerful than the Time Lords them, themselves. Yeah. Uh, I could see that. But again, when you say menacing, it's... I don't know if it's menacing, but yes, single-minded for sure. Um, but they're saying like about the viruses, like if we go on and stuff like that to that last, uh, supposed last Charlie episode, um, where they're talking about how many different uh, uh, viruses there have been, and they've saved every species but four. One being the humans, they weren't able to save or whatever, but of the hundreds of thousands of viruses that were there, they were only able to not save for. So I wouldn't say that they were awful. They're not awful. I, I never said they're awful. Yeah. I just said that they were pretty scary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they look kind of like silence in that picture. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I get it. They should have the thing going across. And that voice, at first, I didn't like because that voice reminded me of Rassilon from when uh, uh, the Eighth Doctor and Charlie were in the, uh, uh, not Neverland, what's the name of that uh, place they had to go to after as in the Zagreus universe there? Ooh, the fucking, Divergent Universe. The Divergent Universe. Um, so that voice of Rassilon in those episodes... I just really couldn't stand. I did not like that voice. And when I heard the Virons, I was thinking, the first thing that goes into my head, that's the same kind of voice as uh, what they think Rassilon should sound like. Uh, but I, I, as the episode grew on, especially that last episode, I really enjoyed the Virons. I really did. I, I like. I was sympathetic pathetic to them to a point the, so, yeah, I mean, again, they're, they're, they have good intentions it's just the way that they're going about those good intentions yeah could be misconstrued yeah i'm glad that you got me to listen to those episodes because i honestly really did enjoy them uh i i thought i could have been uh good with uh with charlie pollard as an eighth doctor companion and just have it but the fact that you know, she goes on to a, a more well-known Doctor in the Sixth and stuff like that. And you can continue those adventures. And it's still the same kind of character, even though she's some of those things or whatever, where it's amnesia and it's it gets a little confusing or whatever, especially at the beginning. Um, maybe not maybe not the best, but, you know, you forgive it or whatever. You're excited. You know, there's Charlie. But here's a question for you. Because I'm sure you've been listening to uh, Big Finish episodes for much longer than I have. Um, were you, yes, were you listening to Big Finish episodes while they were happening? And when you heard the music come on uh, after The Girl That Never Was for The Sixth Doctor, were you really excited or had you already known? Had you already gone to, like, uh, had you started late and you got to a point where, uh, uh, when the music hit or whatever, you already knew that Charlie was going to be part of uh, the Six Doctor Adventures. Well, by the time I, I started listening regularly, mm -hmm. like all 275 episodes were already done. Right. So I, I had all of that to look forward to, but when it comes to the Six Doctor, unfortunately, because of that, because all of it was already uploaded and it was only old news by the time I started listening to all of these again. And again, remember I had to go to the website and f actually prob physically buy all of them 
mm-hmm. one by one. And then suddenly I, I look, I, I, when I go, when I'm scrolling uh, through the website, I suddenly I notice, wait, wait, that's India Fisher on the cover of, a, of an episode with the, the Sixth Doctor. What the hell? So I already kind of knew that yep. this was, it was, was going to be the case that she was going to show up alongside the Sixth Doctor. But still, when he shows up right at the very end, it's like, oh, so that's how they tie the whole thing in. in. And I, I felt like it was a great lead up to that. Now, going back into Patient Zero for a second there, in the midst of this crazy adventure with the Daleks and the virus, uh, the, sorry, the, the Movellan, I think it's the Movellan virus. I, I think so. I'm not, I'm just, it's been a while since I've listened to that one, but in the it's been a day. One, it's been today since I've listened to this one or yesterday, so, but I couldn't tell you the name of the virus. Yeah. I could never remember those kind of things. Yeah, but in the in the mix of this whole like, no wait, sorry, I think I'm I'm referring to Plague of the Daleks, which is a fifth oh. Doctor story, mm-hmm. and that specifically ties in with uh, the, the Daleks Civil War and the Movellan virus, which is a big, huge, big, huge deal there. But in the mix mix of all this with the Daleks versus Virens, almost like a subplot, we get introduced to the character Mila, who apparently yeah. has been sort of traveling with the Doctor. Since the chase, since Ian and Barbara's final episode, right? She's just been hanging around the TARDIS as a disembodied entity until she eventually met Charlie and sort of hijacked her body. And so, for the uh, the remainder of you know, the episode, paper cuts, as well as uh, I think loved the, it. And another episode called um, uh, what the Draconians. It? There's Draconians yeah. in it. The Draconians are finally good characters. Yes. Uh, I, I remember I had you on last year talking about the Draconians. Frontier. Yep. This, Frontier in space. Frontier in space. Yeah. This is the episode that made that that made you even want to even consider talking about the Draconians because of what this thing does to the lore and to their uh, culture. Oh, okay. It's, like, it, I re- just remember. Uh, them being so Shakespearean and being so over the top the way they acted. That I absolutely loved it. I loved it. As soon as I heard them st- talking, I was like, I love them. And then you told me they're in one episode. I was like, what? That's mm-hmm. it? And then I get this. I was so pleased. I was and and did not expect it at all. As soon as I heard the word draconian, I was so excited to listen to this episode. And it was fantastic. It was a great Doctor Who, again, a great episode of Doctor Who. It doesn't matter if it's an audio episode. It was fantastic. So fun. And as over the top, uh, yes. Th- did they overpronounce their S's and stuff like that on purpose? Yes. But, you know, it was, was it like a 1960s uh, Shakespeare teleplay? No, it, they, they reined it in a little bit more. Uh, much more than they did in the frontier in space but yeah i was very excited and i loved it so much and i loved that the the uh red emperors had their uh, all the old emperors had their own paper knights and stuff like that to fight for eternity yeah fantastic a fantastic episode anyways go on sorry no no please please go, go ahead i i love this episode too i love the gush about that episode as much as the next guy Unfortunately, the uh, subplot with Mila and Charlie has been put on hold. Yeah. But it comes back in full force in Forgotten Blue Planet. Yeah. And then there, there we go. There's the, the Viren, right? And then finally, this big, massive plot that's been building up for quite some time with uh, the Virens and other Six Doctor stories, it all finally comes into a head. And it's. We get. The second departure for uh, Charlie Pollard is one of the rare few characters that not only just traveled regularly with two completely different doctors, Mm -hmm. she has two completely separate departures. And like, um, she leaves both of these doctors. And so, first of all, let me ask you this Yeah. Which one do you prefer? The girl that never was or. For, for blue forgotten plan. Oh, I think I prefer, and I can't even claim it's recency bias since I've listened to them yeah, within the same. last uh, two three weeks of each other. 
Um, I think I really do prefer Blue Forgotten Planet. Um, I, it's just the way that uh, the girl who never was ended, I really did see how it was going to go. Um, just with the the cheesy and stuff, but I thought it was like Charlie's left, or like I'm still trying to figure it out because she was sure she saw the doctor die in Vulcan in the lava and stuff like that. And it's just that I listened to this stuff so fast that I didn't pay attention enough. Like I don't, I don't under, I can't remember why. Um, she thinks that the doctor died in that lava flow. You know what? I also have the same issue. I, I do not remember a single a single point in that episode where she has a moment of seeing the doctor dying. So where did that idea right. come from? Yeah. So there's that. Uh, but the Blue Forgotten Planet, it's a, it's a really good episode. It's great. There's a little war going on. There's Charlie versus Charlie at one point with Mila, but you know, but no one being an asshole. Like yeah. it's not like Mila is a jerk. Mila just wants to live, and she, you know, and, and she's still Charlie. Eventually, Mila does the right thing and sacrifices herself. Yep. Uh, yeah. No, I. Yeah. So I'm gonna. Say, yes. And did I listen to that episode today? I did. But. This is not a recency bias. I can honestly say that I do believe it's better. Um, I really, I have really liked the Virens. I really do. Now I want to know more about it and stuff like that. I want to, I want to find out more about it. Like I, again, they're uh, extremely powerful, but are they? You know, are they legitimate assholes? No, they're not. Like they, I think when you can save over half a million different species from dying, you're good. If you have to give up four on the way, then I think that's just good business. <laughs> it just happens to be one of them. One of them is the human race or whatever, but you know, whatever. Yeah, it just you know, it compromises. Yeah. It, they're good at compromising. They get it. Now, if, if you're also, also interested in learning more about the virus and also interested in more, knowing more about uh, Charlie Pollard, she got her own spinoff series right oh. the after that. Just, sh- sh- just the Charlotte Pollard series. I haven't listened to any of it yet, but it seems like she's gone on for a couple of seasons just traveling planet to planet with the virus, sort of trying to... Uh, Fulfill, fulfill her debt to the Virens. Uh, for she was her. she was with them for multi millennia. Somehow, she is almost a, 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 a time lord because she's lived for thousands and thousands of years now. Is it because of the the web of time? As soon as soon as she was saved from the R one hundred and one. Because the web of time has been broken, is that what gives her such a such a long lasting life? Also, because they froze her, I guess, for a while. But yeah, I think it's more so that the the virus just kept her alive. <laughs> She's done right. great service for them for for the stretch of th- thousands and thousands of years, and then eventually, at some point, she comes back and continues to travel with the Eighth Doctor a little the, bit more. What? Yeah, right. I, I, think it's, I think it's called like. Uh, Charlie Pollard and the Eighth Doctor, the Further Adventurous, or something like that. Ooh. Okay, so now that I've finished her adventures with the Sixth Doctor, I can find Charlie Pollard adventures on Big Finish, and then it'll lead me to more Eighth Doctor adventures with Charlie and the Doctor? Yes. Oh, my God. Yeah. All right. It's Like I said, it's Big Finish, the world that never ends. <laughs> Big finish is banana. It's a bananas. It's bananas. Like as the TV show is linear, like it, it is what it is. You get thirteen episodes or so per season, and sometimes you have to wait a year and a bit between stuff and 
get an hour and a half specials every once in a while. But all of, there's so much more. There's so much more with these audio episodes, and you can listen to them wherever. I listen, like you listen to my work. I listen to my, my car. I've listened to these last few at my work, so I made sure that I listened to them all and stuff. But yeah, and, incredible, and, incredible. And and since there, there's no sets involved, there's no physical acting as, as much per se. The no rubber suits. No get, rubber suits. No cardboard yeah, robots. Yeah, the actors can can't be continue, perfect. Continue to do that for as long as they as, as they can. Like they, they can never really stop. Unfortunately, though, for one particular character, her time on Big Finish was finite. And I'm going to going to use this as a great transition from the Sixth Doctor to I I think his best companion, Evelyn Smythe, oh. played by. Uh, the late great Maggie Stables. I know you loved her. I love, I love her. She was the, uh, she was a great companion. She was an S tier companion. My nickname for her is Better Clara. But, but then again, that's, <laughs> then again that, that's a nickname that could just as well be attributed to Charlie Pollard. Notice any similarities between the two characters? Oh, oh sure, sure, of course. Yeah, so uh, you guys yeah. take these two characters together, put them in a blender, mix in a few other big Finnish characters, and somehow the gooey mess that, that came out of it was the character we got in Clara Oswald. And we're not going to go into that rant. Your right? favorite your favorite television companion, Clara Oswald. Yes. The thank girl you. who worked in a diner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ugh, don't even get me started. But... So obviously, Maggie Stables. Uh, I think she made her debut as well as the character. Yes, I don't think it was her first big finish, but she made her debut as the character in the Marion Conspiracy. Okay. As again, a sort of, kind of Clara esque figure. There's some weird mystery concerning her timeline that the Doctor investigates. And then for some reason, the whole storyline just gets dropped. And she just <laughs> continues to travel with the Doctor as a full-on proper companion. Is this after the Charlie Adventures? Like, is this, is, or is this before? Way, way before. Okay. Now, during her time with the Sixth Doctor, she gets to see him at his best and at his worst. And they really uh, form a very, very close uh, bond together. Uh, and just, they... they they become better characters just by, by virtue of being around one another. Mm -hmm. Now, during uh, her time traveling with the Doctor, I'm not going to go over her entire uh, timeline, so to speak, like we just did with Charlie, but during her tra time traveling with uh, the Sixth Doctor, they land on, on a planet in this Ooh. episode, Arrangements for War, one of the best episodes of, of Big Finish Ooh. Of all time ever, and just I almost don't even want to talk about it because I don't want to spoil it too much. That's right. how good it, good it is. But we're getting introduced to this planet and this sort of Romeo and Juliet type scenario world. There, and there's some great uh history where that, and where that girl with that robot guy. Well, uh, it, it's not really a robot. It's uh, it's a uh, military <laughs> armor. But oh. you, you pretty much nail it on the head there. But overall, like there, there is this character uh, Rossiter, who sort of starts to develop feelings for Evelyn during uh, their their time uh, together, and, and then obviously uh, her and uh, the, the Sixth Doctor continue to travel together uh, for for quite a while before eventually Evelyn decides to uh, retire. And when she does, she asks the doctor to take her back to this planet and where she marries Rossiter and they end up living together. And they spend uh, their twilight years, I should say, uh, with, with each other. And then, of course, she resurfaces again in Thicker Than Water when uh, the, uh, the sixth doctor takes uh, his hey. and... What? Yeah. What? It's like, hey, I, I recognize that Bonnie Langford Esmo. Yeah, eventually, yeah, the uh, the sixth doctor takes his, his current companion 
Melanie Bush back to this planet to visit um, a to visit a older uh, Evelyn Smythe. Unfortunately, it's set up fairly early on that uh, she's also, she's also struggling with uh, some health issues, uh, some heart attack related issues, and she doesn't want to tell the doctor about it because she she knows how it will affect him, and she, in, in a way she's trying to protect him from. Uh, the pain and, and the tragedy of uh, of loss, in a way, and this his this character has a much much uh, lasting impact on the Doctor, to to, pull, to the point where eventually he comes back in uh, thicker than water, as a completely different Doctor. But we'll get to that in just a minute. First of all, just having not listened to any of um, Evelyn Smythe's. Stuff aside from Maggie Stables' brief appearance on Zagreus, what do you think about this whole uh, story and the situation that Evelyn Smythe found herself in both Arrangements for War and Thicker Than Water? Uh, all I'm going to say is that if you're vouching for those stories to be two of the best uh, uh, big finish stories that you've ever listened to, I'm in. I'm fully in. And uh, it may have taken uh, Charlie to get me to come around a little bit more on the Sixth Doctor, but I love those Sixth Doctor adventures with Charlie, uh, even though that uh, Colin Baker sounds tired. So I'm 100% I'm in. I will download those episodes uh, tonight and try and get myself up to speed with what you're talking about with them, uh, especially since I'm going on a little bit of holiday here and I will have a little bit of time to listen to them. Um, but yeah, um, I think it's all right. Like it, it, it's against it's she's against the mold for where it comes with the uh, uh, doctor's apprentices. I think, uh, of course, much older. Um, usually, it's a, a you know at one point it's his granddaughter. Um, no one really, uh, I would say, besides the uh, brigadier. Uh, would be the oldest kind and bring it to say the brigadier is a companion. I think it's a bit of a stretch, but yeah, some, like some people like to say that the doctor is the brigadier's companion. Yeah, uh, I would say that. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, it's a, it's a just a totally different dynamic, and of course I'm in for it. I'm I'm totally into hearing uh, what these adventures are like. Just it's just another voice. There's a different narration going to happen when there's someone like that in the doctor's ear. So yeah, I'm very uh, yeah. I'm looking. I'm really looking forward to it. You always get me excited about these goddamn things. Fifty. Goddamn it. That's the point of the show. Now mm -hmm. during um, Evan Smythe's tenure with the Sixth Doctor, they meet this character called Cassandra Schofield, who is just a regular. Um, uh, regular girl from uh, the 1990s-ish or early 2000s-ish who's just trying to make a living to support her son, Tommy. Millennials. Who lives with, who lives with her mother because uh, she she ends up, ends up working as, as a waitress in a bar uh, to, to try and support her son that, that uh, she uh, unfortunately uh, became pregnant after a one-night stand and her, the, the father is like, Completely an absentee father, like nowhere to be found. Again, not unfortunate for the kid. I mean, it, it is unfortunate that there's no one else to support the family. Yes. Like, and and no one's taking and no one besides her is taking responsibility for the kid. Like, yeah, too many pieces of shit. Yeah, a lot of pieces of shit people in the world. But speaking of pieces of shit people in the world, it turns out that surprise, surprise. The bar owners also happen to be vampires. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And, and, and oh. at one, All right. And at one point, uh, Cass Cassandra gets infected and becomes a, a vampire herself. Oh, and, and the doctor promises that, that he'll find a cure. Unfortunately, he's unsuccessful in doing so. But eventually, Cassandra then uh, sacrifices herself to get rid of uh, one of the Doctor's major enemies, Nimrod, mm -hmm. which is where we... Uh, and sometime later, it's revealed that the Seventh Doctor is now traveling... In, in, he comes back in this episode, Thicker Than Water, 
to visit Evelyn Smythe in the hospital and tell her that he's now he's now has this young man traveling with her, this young man who grew up in the far flung year in the far future of 2020. Mm -mm. This guy who ends up being just like the Jetsons. Yeah, just this guy who uh, grows up to be a nurse. I mean, if you heard that before, Rory, Rory Williams. But uh, yeah, in uh, he in I love Rory. Hospital, I love Rory too. But his character is uh, sort of an improvement to a, another character called Thomas Hector Schofield, which is little Tommy all grown up now. Ah, the year twenty twenty. And he travels with the doctor for a while. At, at some point, it's very the the seventh doctor is believed to be dead, which is where eventually Ace and uh, Hex go back to this planet. I, I, I apologize, I keep forgetting the name of the planet that she's on. But, that little Ace. Yeah, they, they go back and, and visit uh, Evelyn Smythe after the doctor passed away, uh, supposedly passed away, and uh, they have this one great adventure. And Hex is a fan favorite. Not this fan's favorite, but he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's beloved by a lot of people. I, I, I don't know. I, I just ne- I just never really warmed up to the character, and I'm sorry if that offends anybody, but I just never did. How never dare really you, did. sir? How dare you? Unbelievable. You don't have the authority. I don't need authority. I have a screwdriver. How dare you? How dare you, sir? Oh boy. I, I love this moment so much. But in any case, he, he's traveled with the Seventh Doctor and Ace for a very, very long time. One of the most prominent companions for the Seventh Doctor on Big Finish. Eventually, some things happen. Uh, long story short, I'm not going to bore you too much with the details, but the TARDIS turns white. But <laughs> eventually, he gets shot. Uh, by a, by a military captain around the same... Eventually, he gets to meet his hero, uh, Florence Nightingale. But uh, yeah. eventually, he's been shot by some uh, stupid British captain. Practically bleeds to death. The doctor tries to fix it by, uh, by going someplace. There's this big, massive storyline that I'm not going to get into right now, but I did, I did say that... But, yeah, it, there's a black TARDIS and a white TARDIS... Giving you a lot of uh, giving you a lot of breadcrumbs to follow. There's yeah. like at one point there's like two completely separate TARDIS teams with Ace and Hex on one oh. side, and you got uh, Lysandra Aristides and uh, Sally Morgan on the other side. Eventually, they all meet up in, in a big combination with the Seventh Doctor's notorious foe from the TV show Fenric. There's a sort Ooh. of celestial godlike chess game being played. That eventually Hex sacrifices himself to save the Doctor and, and, and friends, and then just starts playing games with the gods, essentially. And then one of the gods sort of grants him a a bit of return trip back to Earth, and he comes back to Earth as the character of Hector Thomas, who is eventually then re- get, gets his memory back and uh, reasserts the persona of Thomas Hector Schofield, continues to travel with the Seventh Doctor and Ace for a little bit, and then him and Sally Morgan, that's her on the far right, uh, the, on the bottom side of the, of the picture there, they eventually get married and have kids together in the far future. So uh, I just dropped this m- massive series of bombs on you. <laughs> yeah. What do you think yeah. about this character, and most specifically his, again, another character with two departures? So what do we think about this? <laughs> it's a lot to take in. This is a lot to take in. Uh, and then going to the Seventh Doctor. Seventh Doctor is the only Doctor I've ever met. I met the Seventh Doctor a yeah, few years see. ago. Uh, what do I think? Uh, I, I have to figure out a way that I can find a narrative to start listening to everything so that everything you said... It's going to make cohesive sense. I have a feeling it's not going to, but I don't want I don't want to spoil too many adventures ahead of other adventures. So I want to hear. So I don't know. I'm yes. Yeah, am I looking forward to it? Of course, I'm looking forward to it all. But there is a lot of big finish episodes to listen to, 
and I'm going to have to figure out a way to do it. And you keep throwing everything more at me and stuff like that. It's like, I just found out today that there's more Charlie stuff. Like, I, I had no idea. So, yes, there's a lot. There's a lot to go through. Um, am I looking, yes, am I looking forward to listening to Seventh Doctor stuff? Of course. That it can all tie in together and, yeah, I don't know. This, yeah, way too much information for me. Now, now you're starting to learn why I love this so much. <laughs> why I'm always raving about this stuff. Yeah, I have an idea. Now, starting to. And mm -hmm. let's finish Let's finish up our big finish companions by talking about, about a companion that, compared to the other ones, is somehow relatively simple. Oh. Erime Mushim Teperem. What the heck? Er Erime Mushim Teperem, or Eremem for short, for short, a fifth Doctor companion. Uh, now, when I when I say simple, of course, right. I mean she's an Egyptian pharaoh. Yeah, of course. Yeah, one of, one of the few female pharaohs. Uh, <laughs> I almost I almost knew from the right from the get go. Yeah, from the name. Here's a, an interesting uh, bit of artwork for her. Uh, but yeah, she's played by the character, uh, by the actress Caroline. Morris. Hey, Martians. Yeah, Ice Warriors. And um, basically, long story short, she's believed to have to have dead. That's why her name doesn't appear anywhere in history. And even the doctor doesn't recognize her, uh, recognize her name. Because he's, I think at one point he mentions that he memorized every single uh, pharaoh who ever lived. And he never really, uh, and, and he was pretty sure that there was no Pharaoh Aramem. Uh, so I guess that explains why, because she she left ancient Egypt and started traveling with the doctor before she even got properly coronated and, and crowned as the proper Pharaoh. And uh, she traveled with uh, the fifth doctor and Perry. Uh, Ooh. These adventures are sort of set somewhere between uh, right. After Perry's introduction episode, Planet of Fire, and uh, Peter Davison's final story, uh, The Caves of Androzani, those two episodes are like one of uh, like apart from each other. Like one one is hap happening right uh, before the other, and somewhere in between, they manage to squeeze a boatload of adventures together, and even a completely different companion. Because Big Finish will do that for you sometimes. And, I like uh, it. Eventually, she, uh, uh, after traveling with the Doctor for a while, and this is pretty interesting because I think it, right now she's the only big finish companions uh, aside from, obviously, uh, the late great Maggie Stables who passed away and then she couldn't really do that anymore. But she's the only really big finish companion who didn't actually come back. Like, they gave her a proper, well, there's one we don't talk about, but they gave her a proper exit and never really looked back, uh, back hmm. so much. So, uh, I like they sort of kept her departure a definitive exit from uh, the TARDIS in the episode "The Bride of Paladon." Now, Paladon is an as a planet that has appeared regularly throughout the John Pertwee era. Mm -hmm. It's sort of, in a way, a trilogy. He first appears on the planet alongside his companion Joe Grant in "The Curse of Paladon." Then he appears some time later with Sarah Jane Smith, where the person who was uh, the king of Peladon, played by uh, Patrick Groton's son, by the way, David Ooh. Trout. But, uh, yeah. Oh. So the, uh, the king that uh, the doctor helped in that episode, when he appears later in The Monster of Peladon with Sarah Jane Smith, he meets his daughter. And it's clearly it's clear some time later. And then when the fifth doctor shows up on Big Finish, that's her son. So, like, he met three complete, three generations of uh, the royal family on Peladon, and Aramem, being of royal descent, uh, eventually ends up falling in love with uh, the king and marrying him. He's supposed to marry a human princess, which sort of was going to lead into a sort of uh, a peace treaty between the Earth Alliance and Peladon. And, and during the course of the story, it turns out that while the the person the woman she that he's about he's supposed to marry they do they do definitely do like each other but they don't really ha connect in the same way together and they don't they don't they don't don't really feel like this arranged marriage 
is good for them. Like it's not, it's not gonna, it's not really. Uh, they're they're not really marrying for love. They're only marrying for um, for duty. But somehow it all manages to get fixed when uh, Aramem, who is of course of royal descent, she actually does connect with the uh, with the king of the current king of Peladon. And in a in a weird adventure that involves a certain Osiren, that's another race that uh, I mentioned to you that only appears in one episode of the TV show. So uh -huh. it's hint there, but during an adventure involving a certain Osiren character, they eventually uh, overcome uh, the crisis on Peladon yet again, and uh, they fall in love together and uh, they get married, and that's how she leaves the TARDIS. So, oh, that's uh, nice. Any any brief words on that? Uh, I would say I hope they walk like an Egyptian. Uh, I still haven't uploaded this sound effect into the mix, but <laughs> you're, you're kind of forcing my hand here. Hold oh, on. my God. I, oh, I am... What did I do? Oh, no, no. You're not getting away from this. Hold on. We can probably get away with it. Hold on, hold on. Yay! Okay, now, now you actually you gave me a reason to upload this thing into the. Uh, into uh, the you're welcome. You're welcome, then. So, is that the only thing you have to say? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so, uh, there's so on. there's so much there's so much fifty there is so much. So much. Uh, okay, so there are how many adventures in Big Finish? Two hundred and forty. Is that right? The monthly range is two hundred and seventy-five. Oh my god! And that's not counting other adventures with these doctors in between here and there, and other doctors as well, and other spin. -off. I did tell you it is a massive, massive thing. That's like in the hundreds, if not over a thousand adventures just pretending to the role of Doctor Who. Right. Other stuff that have nothing to, that have nothing to do with Doctor Who. On Big Finish there is like Blake 7 stuff. There's even some Star Trek adventures there just saying. On, on Big Finish. Yep, yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's Big Finish original stories, there's Dark Shadows, The Avengers, The British Avengers just to Yeah, I was sure. going to say I was going to say like Emma Peel adventures, right? Avengers, and, right? Like so many other stuff. There's literally thousands of stories to be found on Big Finish. Unreal. Um, will I ever get there's, to? There's also, there's also, there's also. I just remember. There's also Thunderbirds stuff. On oh, Big I loved the Thunderbirds when I was a kid. Thunderbirds or go. Um, will I ever get to? Uh, a f potential pharaoh companion? I hope so. I do hope so. I hope I get to all of these, but there is so much. There is so much, and you keep throwing all these adventures at me. I want to go through, like, from the original TV series, I want to start getting through all of that. There's all the big fish. There is so much. It, like, just to have it look, just to look at it, it seems daunting. But excited. Like, I never thought, like, when we were talking earlier this week, I didn't, I thought it was going to be difficult to get through the the three episodes we were talking about. And then I went through five. It's just, it's, it's just one of those things where you just go through them and stuff like that. You get very excited about it, especially when they're well written, they're well acted, especially, you know, they're, it's a radio play. These are radio plays you're listening to, but uh, the actors bring life to the stories, they, uh, especially life to the characters. But, you know, like there's episodes where uh, it seems like war is going on and you can feel it. You can feel the tension and stuff like that. It isn't uh, just people yelling and screaming or whatever. You, you can feel an actual tension. Also, um, what would a cockney actor do without Big Finish? Because there are a lot of Cockney accents in outer space. Some Scottish ones, which I'm very excited for. Uh, but yeah, I'll, you could tell someone's going to be a baddie if they talk 
start talking like this. Like, I can't even do it. I'm, I'm the worst. I'm the worst Cockney accent guy since uh, uh, Dick Van Dyke. But, uh, yes. <laughs> out, out, on, outer space. The guy's still alive. Come on. Outer space is the worst for, for Cockney accents, it seems. But good for them. They made it. Everybody, everybody in England is represented <laughs> in the big finish, and especially in outer space. But they're usually bad guys, so they're typecast. But I loved it. I did love it. I, I like... The Charlie Adventures, Karis is, yeah, I en I enjoyed parts of Karis, uh, but those uh, those ones with them in the Divergent uh, universe and stuff like that, like when uh, like Charlie's the big slug that's giving birth to uh, to the babies and stuff like, that. yeah, those are the kind of episodes I love. So, um, and that was very. That was very soon on to when you got me starting to listen to uh, Big Finish, so it, it automatically grabbed me. Um, so yes, it for someone to replace Charlie as a favorite of mine in the Big Finish space, I yeah, it'll be tough because it's your first or whatever. It's like everyone's first doctor is usually their favorite doctor and stuff like that. Well, she's my first big finish companion and stuff like that. And the Eighth Doctor is my first big finish doctor. So it's difficult. It'll be difficult for anybody to surpass that. But I, I know you show a lot of passion for lots of the, uh, the companions in big finish. So, yes, I am very excited. I will absolutely try and listen to as much as I can. Um, and hopefully we'll find time to talk about it here. On the greatest show in the galaxy. You know what this reminds me of? Back when I was in the military, that was when uh, Marvel had their big presentation where they announced all of Phase 3. Right. You remember they had that, the thing where they had Chadwick Bos the late, great Chad Chadwick Boseman on stage. They introduced him as Black Panther. And they did that thing with, with Chris Evans and Robert Down Jr. of the, the tug of war of that character. So I, I had this friend who just... Uh, who just uh, became my, my roommate at the time. And he was like, well, well who's this Black Panther character? Well, what, what's this? Uh, he, he kept asking me about all these new characters that just got announced. Though, What is this Captain Marvel thing? Well, what's the, the Civil War? And, and I just Ooh. sat down and broke everything down with him. I explained to him who Ant-Man was. I explained to him all, everything that needed to know, he needed to know about Black Panther and Captain Marvel. And I can't remember all the Phase 3 episodes that were... Uh, Announced that he told him all about the Ragnarok stuff. For some reason, he seemed to be very interested with the Inhumans. Look how that turned out. All right. But all right. Like, all I, right. I, I explained to him all about Galactus and like all this deep, rich Marvel lore to the point where Annihilus. Like, Did you talk about Annihilus? Maybe I don't. I don't remember. We talked about a, a bunch of stuff there. We even talked about Spider Ham. Believe it or not. Like somehow the conversation drove, drove us to Spider-Man. Peter, Por Peter Porker. Peter Porker, yeah. yeah. And J. Jonah Jackal. But at some point he's like, stop, stop, I can't. I, my brain can't handle it anymore. Before, <laughs> he's like, before I, I get met it. You, I get it. Before I met you, my brain had this full one gigabyte of information that was blank. Like nothing there. And now it's full, full to the brim. There's nothing less left I can shove into this brain anymore. I need a break. This is what this reminds me of. So this being my show, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to give you a break because sure. there's a couple more characters we got to talk about here. Let's, and now, do, it. Let's do it. We, we're now out completely outside. The, well, not completely, but a little bit outside the big finish realm. Moving into the comics Ooh. from the 80s. Mm. And we're going to talk about the first ever companion of color, Sharon Davis. Years and years before we had Martha, we had this character introduced alongside the fourth doctor on the comic book run and um, the original comic book run from um, hey. Doctor Who magazine. What? And K9. Yeah, Don't forget K9. Yeah, K9. It also introduced. 
the legendary mythical character of Beep the Meep, which we are not. Oh going yes, to, which we you are talked about to, him. Yeah, we are, we are go- also going to see in the 60th anniversary with David Tennant. We see him in the trailer, Beep the Meep and the Wrath Warriors. They make they make their li- live action debut finally uh, at long freaking last. But yeah, mm-hmm. Sharon Davis was a, was a little girl from uh, Blackpool. I think, yeah, I think it was Blackpool. I can't, I can't mm-hmm. remember. But uh, yeah, she's the, obviously, as, as mentioned earlier, the first uh, companion of color. She's an African British uh, companion uh, who travels with the doctor. And this is, again, st- during the randomizer era, where long story short, after the, uh, defeating the Black Guardian in a previous season with uh, the first Romana, the doctor builds this thing called the randomizer. That completely randomizes the coordinates, making sure that he will never ever know, even more so than usual, where the TARDIS is going to land, in sort of a way to avoid the Black Guardian, because even the Black Guardian can't track him down if even he himself doesn't know where, where he's going. So, while well, after saving uh, uh, Sharon's hometown from uh, Beep the Meep, he tries to get a lot of people uh, out out to safety, he, uh, and he tries to uh, to, to save. Sharon Davis uh, from the uh, um, the destruction of a, of a building. He tries to get her back home, but because of the randomizer, they end up going on a completely different path in life. They meet up with Daleks. They meet some Sontarans in that comic book run. Oh. She gets she gets this uh, cool yellow jumpsuit, and sometime later in the in the run, they meet the Time Witch. Yeesh. It exists between two different realms, where and in order to cross between those two realms, they have to cro- uh, to jump from one crack in time to the, to another, aging several years in the process. Which is why Sharon goes from being a teen- a schoolgirl to being a fully mature woman by the end uh, by the end of the story. And so- a couple of stories later, they land on on, on a planet full of uh, people who uh, can actually manifest their dreams. Uh, any sort of a physical form, sort of, and uh, she falls in love with this guy right here and decides to stay behind. Black Castle, sorry, not Black Blackpool, Black Castle. My my mistake, because Blackpool, I think, is a um, um, it's a coastal uh, town. It's like a yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm, uh, it's um, Blackpool is pretty close to the- no, it's just uh, Lucy Miller, Lucy Miller, oh. another eighth Doctor companion. And I think, I think Clara Oswald is also from Blackpool. But I'm not 100% sure on that. So yeah, two of my least favorite companions are from the same city. Go figure. But yeah, she eventually falls in love with this guy and decides to stay behind on the planet, leaving the doctor to continue to travel to travel, travel the TARDIS on his Who own. can blame her? Who can blame her? I mean, look at the guy. Come on. Mm-hmm. They both have blue hair. <laughs> Yes, yeah, absolutely. So, what do you think about this character? Without knowing a single thing about her, uh, I'm always looking forward to uh, companions if they ever have interactions with K9. So, yes, I like. Here's the thing: it's going to be so tough. Like you, uh, like as the curator, as the guy who knows so much about Doctor Who lore and about everything to do with it to say to someone okay there's also this and there's this but wait there's this the head just starts going ping 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 ping. it's like yes i'd like to see all of this stuff it's like am i going to be able to find 1980s comic books of dr who in canada it's going to be a little difficult but are they online somewhere? I can try. always try and find it. So, yes, if I ever have a chance to see it, I'd be very excited. I'd be very excited to see it, well, especially because I, I would automatically just have the K-9 theme song in my head for the entire time. All I would do is think K-9, like, the entire time. Well, it, but it'd be fun. Yeah, But I guess now you have to, to, to research it because of Beep the Meep. Yes. You gotta get ready for the 60th anniversary, right? You gotta. You, you have gotta... talked about Beep the Meep 
uh, a lot. So yes, I as Sergi told me that Beep the Meep is going to be in the 60th anniversary thing. It's like okay, I'm ready. I'm ready for Beep the Meep, and I'm also ready to, for a theme song for Beep the Meep. I hope they make one. Now, some of the there is one. There is one. Speaking of which, some of those comic book adventures have been adapted into Big Finish mm. as well. And the character Sharon Davis does actually make her Big Finish debut as part of that. So I highly recommend checking that out. And uh, moving on from a classic era comic companion to a modern era comic book companion, mm. another companion I'm dying to see make it, make his TV debut and one of my favorite Meep comic the beep. Companions. Meep yeah. the beep. Meep the beep, yes, absolutely. One of my favorite Doctor Who companions who's never actually been on the on the TV show and ma- managed to make, make such a great impact despite having a relatively short run in the comic books. Are you ready for this? Yes. Are you sitting comfortably? Wait. Okay. Wait. All right. Go ahead. Kevin the T-Rex. <laughs> You've talked about him before, too. <laughs> 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 too funny t-rex. too funny kevin the t-rex oh boy mannered android t-rex from the planet dream world basically the, the planet itself no, dream sorry. world not dream world sorry multi-world sorry my bad yep. but basically the planet itself it's kind of like uh what was what's the, what's the um it's all like Westworld without the sex. Isn't this the same? Is this the same one that was in uh, the seven, the eighth Doctor Adventures or whatever? When uh, uh, the old, like, wasn't it in Zagreus? No, no, no. It's it's a it's a different world. Ooh, and that's um Winkle's Wonderland. That Built sorry, that's what I'm thinking of. Yep. But multi world. Basically, it's just the whole planet is separated into segments where you can basically live out your any fantasy you wish in any time period, whether it be the di- uh, the the time of the dinosaurs, With the old Kevin. west, yeah, the 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 old west, the Arabian Nights, World War Two, like all these different eras uh, are just basically laid out for you. Just pick one, and you can. Uh, be uh, be a character in your own story. The entire planet is populated with these uh, multi-purpose androids that basically take on any role you give them, much like Kevin himself. Eventually, long story short, basically the, the Eleventh Doctor takes Amy and Rory to the planet as part of their uh, me- part of the many many locations that he took them at for their honeymoon. And then some Sontarans show up because why the hell not? And this big sort of conspiracy theory happens on the planet. Eventually the 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 leader of the world which was each was who was a fan of the doctor at one point turns on him and joins the Sontarans. The, the doctor sort of with the help of Kevin uh, um deposes him from the world and re, uh, returns the world back to uh its proper uh, back to uh, back to business I should say. And then Kevin just asks the doctor if he'll take him with him. In the TARDIS, you'll fit. The doctor and Amy and Rory do. They, they yeah. take they they take this giant, massive talking T Rex with them in the TARDIS. It's don't bigger on the they, inside. It's bigger on they, the inside. For, just don't ask on. me how they got him through the doors. But yeah, it's they, also they it's off. also bigger. I don't know. Yeah, but but the the they do a couple of adventures together. But eventually, I think at one point they realized that the idea of having a massive T-Rex going inside and outside the TARDIS would have been kind of a problem. So they reached this big sort of space station that's sort of at the center of a lot of different uh, transits. And some crisis happens there. Kevin uh, helps out uh, to uh, get rid of the crisis itself. And in the process, gets these cool, badass mechanics. <laughs> and this and this massive armor and looks like Grimlock. To... Yes, he does. And eventually stays behind on the space station as a bodyguard. Cool. Such a cool character and such an unfortunately tragically short run in the comic books. 
Well, uh, you never know. You never know. He may come back at any time. Yeah, I mean, we, we're getting beep the meep. Yeah. Is it, is it any big of a stretch to say that this guy could show up? Kevin. Kevin, a mm -hmm. mild-mannered T-Rex. Yeah, with robot armor. Yeah, so no learning most about most of his storyline uh on this episode with six arms six arms what's up with what that what do you mean six arms well he has the t his two legs he has the two robot arms and then he has two other arms below the robot arms yeah the, the, his regular arms and some robot arms right like, so he has oh, yeah six so he's six he's six appendages yeah when only holding binoculars, so I don't know how well that's going to work, but whatever. So what what do you think about his departure, staying behind as a bodyguard with this badass armor that he's got on? I think Kevin should have his own show. Me Enough too. of this shit. Enough of this. Give Kevin a rocket ship, and he can go and settle problems on multiple planets just by being a dinosaur it's like i think they should all sit down at like a treaty table and try and be very peaceful and him just saying enough and then just chew on one of the guys that are there it's like this isn't how things work here on this planet and then just chew on that guy and just that's how peace is settled peace is settled by kevin's either gonna eat you or you guys are gonna get along yeah i mean who's who's gonna break the law when they know this guy is the bodyguard that's right uh, the, law, the law enforcer Jeff Who Goldblum. That's that? it. Jeff Goldblum. That's it. Dude, Jeff Goldblum has good voice. Yeah, you're you're a genius. Don't kill me. You know. I get it, but genius. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah, now now I can't picture anyone but Jeff Goldblum as a <laughs> Russ yep. Russell, Russell, I know you're listening. Make it happen. That's right. Can't now, be difficult. On to, on to our final companion. Now we talk big finish. We talk mm -hmm. comic books. What's let's left? Jump, let's jump into some books. Oh or rather a book. And also my personal favorite Doctor Who novel at the moment. Mm. Engines of War. Oh, all Your right. Dream, the War Doctor, of course. Mm -hmm. In the final days of the Time War. So in this book, which I highly, highly recommend, especially getting the audio version, because, of course, it's narrated by Nicholas Briggs, who plays the, 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 the Daleks. He also does a great impression of the War Doctor. Like, okay. it's almost spot on. You can tell he put a lot of effort into uh, that performance, but in this book, we are introduced to the character Cinder. Jeez. A, a sort of human freedom fighter who fights against the Daleks on the planet Moldox in the Tantalus Spiral. And uh, ev eventually she, uh, she, meets, she meets up with the War Doctor when he literally crashes on top of her. Almost. Like he, she's, fighting a bunch, she's, fi she's fighting a bunch of... Uh, Dalek degradations, which I think we talked about them in our Dalek T ranking list we did last year, like these mutated uh, giant Daleks with spider legs. Oh yes, yes, yes. He's fighting, he's fighting a couple of them, and uh, the TARDIS fall literally falls from the sky and crashes on top of one of them, destroying them, saving her in the process. And then she uh, joins the Doctor. They uh, go through uh, the uh, the great what used to be the great human city on Moldox. They fight some. Uh, they discover some secret. What they the Daleks are planning. They go back to Gallifrey to try and warn the Time Lords. There's some messy stuff there where they find out that the Time Lords are actually planning to detonate the weapon of mass destruction known as the Tear of Aisha, to uh, which is a um, weapon that's uh, meant that's designed to collapse black holes to hopefully destroy the Daleks in the Tantalus Spiral, destroying 12 billion humans in the process. And at which point the, the doctor re uh, finally realizes that the Time Lords, how far the Time Lords have sunk, that they've now become just as bad as the Daleks, if not even worse. He will rescues Barusa as the uh, as the possibility engine. He takes him back to the, uh, the Tantilla Spiral, fights the Daleks one final time, and in the process throws Barusa into the Tantilla's eye, 
uh, destroying uh, the Dalek Eternity Circle in, uh, in the, the, the Dalek presence in the Tentacle Spiral. Unfortunately for him, Cinder dies in the process. Oh boy. Dies. I thought she I thought she would be burnt to cinders. <laughs> She had a flamethrower. Uh, no, it's not a flamethrower. That's a uh, Dalek weapon. And, and I love that she also took out the Dalek eye stock and she's using it as yes, a Yes, now I, now I see that or whatever, but I figured, oh, that's just some kind of yeah. flamethrower with that little thing on the back. The thing, the thing is, she doesn't even know her own name. No one knows. They, they just found her as a little girl in the ruins of her, of her house, which was destroyed by the Daleks, practically burned to a cinder. And because they found her in the ruins of her burning house, and because she's got this bright red red head, red red hair, they decided to call her Cinder, and she's never looked back. Never looked back since. Wow! wow. Until of course she eventually uh, uh, saves the Doctor from getting shot by a Time Lord named Karnak. I think Karla. Uh, it's been a while since I've read the book, but yeah, I think I, I can't remember if it's the uh, the, the Time Lord Karlax that. Uh, Carnax, Carlax, whatever, who shoots the doctor, or if it's a Dalek, but either way, she saves the doctor from getting from getting shot. She basically takes a bullet for the doctor, and then the doctor uses uh, the uh, the possibility engine to destroy the Dalek presence in the Tantalus spiral, pretty much returning it to how it used to be before the time war reached that particular era area in space time. He then eventually buries her uh, in the next to the ruins of her home. And that is when the doctor finally looks up to the sky and, sa and says the immortal words, no more. Yes. That is the moment the doctor decided there's no saving the, the time wars, the time lords. There's no hope for the time war anymore. This war has got to end. And that is when he decides to break into the time vaults and into the Omega Arsenal. Steal the moment, and that what that is basically the events that kick off the events of the day of the doctor. So, uh, you you just heard about this character for the first time, yeah. What do you think? I think uh, Cinder is an a little on the nose for what's happened to her, but um, uh, like 50, you have a, a way of talking about these things. I am honestly. A shocked that you have such recall with these things, and be like just the passion, like the passion you talk about with all these things, be it comic book, be it novel, be it big finish, be it um, the original series, be it the new series, is palpable. Like you can feel how much you give a shit about all of it. So you can't help, you cannot help but be interested. And, and want to know more? Like, I'm, would I love to read more about the War Doctor? Yes, of course. Yes, I would love to hear more now. Of course, because John Hurt, come on. Yeah, yes. And I remember John Hurt from when I was a wee little boy. Uh, but um, uh, what, what was your first exposure to John Hurt? If you don't mind me asking, uh, it might be uh, Alien. I think I was five years old when I saw that. Six years old, uh, but uh, 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 the Ipscris was it Ipscris file something like that. There's like the spy movie that he was in and stuff like. Yes, there's a lot. There's a lot from like the early uh, '80s, late '70s that I got to see. A lot of which on Betamax. Mm. Uh, thank you for aging me, guys. I'm only 18 years old, but. Um, yes, timey, timey, wimey stuff. Like I've, I'm just, I've yes, just become seen, an adult. Seen it on his grandparents' Betamax. Yes, uh, I remember seeing old home movies of someone that looked just like me. Uh, back in the '80s, watching this kind of stuff. But yeah, uh, yes, all these things. You always get me excited about watching. Like you got me excited about listening to Big Finish. So I did. I like you wanted to talk about the anniversary um, anniversary shows and stuff like that. So it's like you got to watch. You, got, you should listen to the greatest. But if you want to listen to Grace, listen to Nevermind Never or Land. Neverland, Neverland. So I said, sure. And 
I've listened to I listened to every single one after that. Went back, listened, went over to the uh, Six Doctor. Listen, you said, well, uh, you should listen to at least the last three. So I listened to those three. Then I listened to two more, uh, the first two ones. Or the only, and then I started listening to the one where uh, there's a uh, 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 robber barons or something. Like the one, the one about the Dick Dick Stockton or whatever his name is, the uh, um, uh, highwayman or whatever. So there, yeah, there's. I listened to quite a bit. Um, Excited about everything. Enjoyed everything. There's a couple of things with Karis where I didn't understand. I don't under. I never understood why he was around for so long. I think he was a character that should have been gone earlier. So you don't like Karis then? He was fine. Karis was fine. I think that a lot of people in that universe, except for the guy with an exoskeleton, um, changes his skin color. Yeah, it was, behind him. Yeah, but you know, it's 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 Doctor Who, so you suspend belief. You know what I mean? Uh, you're you're fine with it, and then him talking about how he's a mass murderer a lot or whatever. So you you expect more evil out of him, but you don't even get that. So it, yeah, it was a he was an odd character. He was a mass murderer, but he's also a monk. Yeah, he was a mass murdering monk. Because, uh, yep. because those two concepts work so well together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mass murdering monk, uh, whose wife he had to Who's kill because she, she was a big larva, a big larva that pooped out a bunch of uh, evil uh, larva babies and stuff. Yeah, and his last right. memory of her, she begged him. She begged him to kill her. Yeah. But he felt bad about it forever. Yeah. Whatever. So much so that he that uh, he uh, became he became a god and sacrificed himself mm. by exploding into liquid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's Doctor Who, guys. Get with the program. Yeah, and it made Charlie turn against the Doctor a little bit after that because uh, the Doctor was like, "Yeah, okay, great. What's next?" <laughs> Because that's the doctor. He always moves on. Yeah, that's his because thing. If he spends too much time thinking about it. He he will explode himself. Yeah, I get it. I get why the doctor does what he does. Yeah, I understand. That that's... an Edwardian adventurous, maybe not. Yeah, an but I get it. needs some time to pro the process. She's only human. The doctor, as mentioned, we talked about a lot of we talked about a lot of companions today that all oh, had their, their signature uh, departure and left, and the doctor had to keep uh, moving on and going on. But that is a story for another time. Ooh. And uh, before we move on, I just wanted to point out uh, my first exposure to uh, John Hurt. Would have been uh, him as Mr. Ollivander in the Harry Potter movies. Oh, shit, I'm so old. <laughs> in the first Harry Potter movie, that is. But the yeah. role that I actually properly, genuinely remember him is the storyteller. Oh, okay. Have you ever seen the storyteller, by the way? No. I th Is that, uh, geez, is that the one with Macaulay Culkin? Uh, no. That's All right. That, that's it. A t that's like a TV show where he's in a bookshop with a talking dog, and he's like, "What?" Yeah, he's telling these old legends and folk tales, and just you know, he's just there to, to narrate the stories, and then other actors come in and like oh. play, play certain characters in these stories, and then occasionally the the talking dog shows up in those stories, and uh, try and asks random questions. So in a way, he was a doctor with a companion, with a dog was, companion, before he was the doctor. I was going to ask if this dog companion also went on to solve mysteries of his own with another companion, uh, usually to deal with Satanists. <laughs> I knew you were going there. I knew you were going there. Uh, but I'll, I think I'll just wrap this up by saying that my favorite role of John Hurt is, of course, of course, the Elephant Man. Now, uh, oh. Mr. S Mr. Snark. By the way, I'm just mm -hmm. noticing 
Is the double R on purpose? Yes, because I looked up uh, how to uh, spell Karis before we came into it. It's like C apostrophe R S S. It made no sense. It's like Karis. It's, that's how they want to spell it. It's like, okay. Karis, fine. Yeah, so I'll just say, okay, I'll put S N apostrophe blah, blah, blah. And I'm yeah, fine with I that. I guess uh, Euterminism spell differently. Yeah. Uh, they're mass murdering monks. What do you want from them? Of course. Who then get invaded by giant insect people. Yep, that's true. The giant authoritarian Nazi insect people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In a universe with Not no time. I mean, we can go on, like seriously. Yeah, they don't even on. understand it. They have no idea. Yeah, they have no idea well, why there's no once time. In a, once in a while, the story will slip up, and they will not address it. But that's fine. Because the it's show has cool. to go on. That's true. So, Mister Snark, mm -hmm. you have you have a lot of homework to do. And <laughs> yes, and I while, do. And while you're doing that, mm -hmm. where can the good people of the internet find you? And Holy shit, where can you find me? Okay, so uh, if you guys are watching this on the Northern Entertainment Group, uh, Tuesdays I have a show called Have You Seen This? We talk about what's happening in the world of television. We just really talk about uh, shows that we've been particularly interested in. Maybe we talk a little news. Uh, our last episode, we finally did some of our... Uh, awards for 2022 so please go back find that other than that you can find me on let's get rain network uh i talk about the english premier league and uh also you could try and find me on twitter at snark yeti not a good follow guys not a great follow because i really do not do much at all but uh, I try to get on good old 50 show at least once a month because I love talking Doctor Who and I especially love talking about it with uh, that guy over there. And I'm learning how the camera works this way. Hold on. Let, let me confuse you even more. Uh-oh. Oh, shit. <laughs> Oh, do the walk like an additional thing again. Mm -mm. That and, way. Yeah, and as for me, you can find me every. Uh, hopefully, we're going. I'm going to go back to every Monday on the Greatest Show in the Galaxy. This show, and uh, me and Soda have another 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 show in the works right now called Fun with Flags. We're, we're yeah. sort of working our way to where we can finally debut that show. I also have my own YouTube channel called Fifty Shades of Geek, where I do weekly Doctor Who reviews of. Um, a of Doctor Who episodes from 1963 all the way to 2022, and I'm also almost done with season two at, at the moment. But uh, I also show up on a lot of other shows from the Ben Verse Network, which also includes the Northern Entertainment Group, which is this channel, as well as uh, Movie Lovers Unite, A Town Reviews, Something to Talk About, uh, Galaxy Geeks, Midnight Cinema, and Multiverse of Geekdom. In, I know most of those guys. In loving memory of our good friend Ben Rayner. May he rest in peace. And uh, yeah, that's it uh, for the day. That's all we can talk about. So, uh, Mr. Snark, thank you for coming on. We're of course. definitely looking forward to having you on more episodes all throughout the year. But until then, everybody, a new body. <laughs> yeah. I love it so much. The